All right, welcome back everybody. Next up, we're gonna talk about other animal groups as we move forward. The thing I wanna mention now is what's gonna happen during our development. Remember we took our balloon, if you will, uh, that gastrula stage, and we took our thumbs and pushed it in when we were making the development of the digestive track, and I mentioned the blastopore. Well, as that continues to develop, there's a couple of different outcomes. Not only do you get the ectoderm on the outside and you get the endoderm forming the digestive tract, somewhere along the way, depending on the animal, some of that middle tissue forms what's called mesoderm. And the mesoderm ends up being the muscles and the organs in development inside the body. And when that happens, there's sort of three different sort of outcomes that can occur in terms of how the mesoderm forms. One is that the mesoderm forms these solid blocks, and that's what you see in this top picture here, and that's called an aceliomate. An aceliomate is an organism that has no body cavity. Down below, you can see a what's called a pseudo celiomate, and that's an organism that has what we call a false body cavity. And then the last one down below is called a, cili a celiomate or a euceliomate, and those are all the other organisms, and they have a true body cavity. And they look very similar, but you'll notice if you look closely that in the euceliomate or the celiomate, the mesoderm lines the entire space. In the pseudocelomate, there's a space, but it comes right up to the endoderm tissue and it doesn't, it's not completely surrounded. Now, the reason a body cavity of some sort, whether it's a pseudocelomate or a true celiomate, is important is it allows organisms to grow organs and, and have organs stretch inside that bo body cavity, for example. So humans, as an example, we have a body cavity and, and that's where our organs are inside. And so one of the things, for example, that you're able to do, if you eat a really big meal, your, your body, your stomach, and your digestive tract can kind of stretch a little bit into that space. A lot of these animals use that body cavity during certain times of the year, for example, to grow um, testes or ovaries for reproduction. The first phylum we're going to talk about here today is the phylum platyhelminthes. These are the flatworms and they are aceliomates and they have a gastrovascular cavity as do the Nigerians we mentioned before. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. And they have an organ system level of organization. So first we started with cells, then we went to tissues, and now we're seeing that these animals have actual organs. And they are triploblastic, which means they have three tissue layers, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Those are the three, the total three that you can have that are found in all animals from here on out. The difference between a digestive uh, gastrovascular cavity and alimentary canal is really basically how many openings you have. So in things like the platyhelminthes, and this is also true in the Nigerians, they have what's called a gastrovascular cavity and food comes in through the mouth and gets digested but then the waste actually goes out that same hole so you've got one space where digestion occurs and then the waste of it is excreted if you will, through that same hole. In an alimentary canal, you have a mouth and then it passes through a tube of some sort and it comes out the anus on the other end of the animal. So an alimentary canal is, it has two openings and that ends up being important uh, in part um, in animals with those two uh, openings, alimentary canal, because you can have different parts of the digestive tract specializing in different things as you go. Okay, so first class within the phylum platyhelminthes is the turbellaria, and these are the mainly the free-living, mostly marine flatworms. Uh, so there's some on land, but there's many in the ocean. That's why we bring them up here. Many of them are very colorful, have, have really interesting colors and things of that sort. They're one of the first groups of animals to also demonstrate what's called cephalization. So cephalization is basically just the idea 
that organisms now have a head uh, that can be used for sensing the environment and, and interpreting things, okay? They also have a gastrovascular cavity, which I just mentioned, and they have really good ability to regenerate. So there are lots of studies done on flatworms where they do things like cut the head in half and it can grow two heads. So flatworms have a really good ability to grow body parts back uh, when they are uh, amputated. And, and so there's a lot of research that's been done on those animals, trying to mainly figure out if that can be done in other things. There's some really interesting uh, examples of flatworms. Uh, many of these are found in your book just as examples to see. You don't need to know the different species. This is an interesting one where these two flatworms are engaging in what's called penis fencing. So they are hermaphrodites, so they have both male and female parts, but they're fighting each other and one of them, uh, both of them are trying to fight and inject their, they have this sharp penis that they can puncture into the other one and they're trying to fertilize um, each other and the one that fertilizes the other one uh, the the one that gets fertilized basically has to repair the injury of having the penis stuck in them and then also has to take care of the eggs and that sort of thing so it's a mating strategy where potentially both of them could be stabbed with this harpoon penis and inject sperm in them and they both then uh, become pregnant but in these flatworms it's called penis fencing the next class is the cestoidea these are the flatworms the flatworms are common in animals on land and they are big parasites uh, including ones found in humans I only mentioned one here since it's marine biology the cestoidea the class cestoidea with these tapeworms have these repeating body parts called proglottids and they can be really really long they're tiny they're microscopic but they can be long with these repeating proglottids basically every kind of animal you can think of has a tapeworm in it and in, in our case there are fish that have tapeworms where humans can potentially have a problem with this is eating low-grade sushi so I eat sushi all the time, by the way, but I eat, uh, you know, I eat good sushi. I don't go to a, a place that is sketchy, okay? Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is during development is what happens when I take my uh, balloon and I push my thumbs through and I talked about that blastopore, that opening. Well, as that continues to go through, it comes out on the other end and one end, the blastopore, ends up forming either the mouth or anus and the other end forms the mouth or anus on the other side. And it depends on what kind of animal it is. So there are two groups of animals that we'll see here that allow us to sort out which ones are which, and they are called protostomes and deuterostomes. Protostomes are animals in which that first opening, the blastopore, becomes the mouth. Proto first stone refers to the mouth. So a protostome is an animal in which that first opening ends up forming the mouth. Deuterostomes, which is us, the second opening becomes the mouth. So in humans, for example, in you, the first hole that you had on your body ends up being your anus. Whereas if you were a worm, it would end up being, um, the first hole would end up being your mouth. All right, so when we talk about protostomes and deuterostomes, uh, we'll find there's a big group of protostomes that include the mollusca, clams and snails, annelids, arthropods, all that kind of stuff, which we'll go into. And then there are deuterostomes, which is a much smaller group in terms of diversity wise, and those will be the echinodermata, and then eventually the chordata, which will lead us to vertebrates, which include us. So first we're gonna talk about, these are all that we're going to talk about now are all protostomes. So these are all animals that we're talking about now that, have, that are triple blastic. They have three tissue layers and that first opening, the blastopore, forms the mouth. The second one forms the anus and these all have a complete digestive tract, have a true alimentary canal with specialization along the way. So the first group is called the lophophorate phyla. There's actually three different phyla here, the ectoprocta, the pheronids, and the brachiopods. And they're all called the lophophorate phyla because they have all three of those phyla, even though they're different organisms and different phyla even, they have 
this structure right here called the lophophore. And the lophophore is a specialized group of tentacles that are used for feeding. So you have the ectoprox, uh, ectoprocta, which are also called bryozoans, which are a colonial like, they grow kind of like a moss almost. Uh, if you've seen a uh, close up picture zoomed in of moss, uh, they're called a thallus, each little one. They look kind of like these ectoproctas here, uh, but they are actually a kind, again, they're their own group and they have these this feeding structure called the uh, lophophore. Then we have the pheronids. These are a marine tube worm. There's actually many different marine tube worms, but once again, these pheronids have this lophophore structure. And then, and the last of the three are called the brachiopods. These are also called the lamp shells. They look very much like a clam, but again, they don't typically have uh, a structure like these feeding tentacles, so that's unique. Next we have a phylum called Nermitia. Uh, these are also called ribbon worms or proboscis worms. They have a closed circulatory system. I'm going to mention that in a second. They have a complete digestive tract, which is the same as having a complete alimentary canal. So they have a mouth on one end, anus on the other. And they have a proboscis. They have this mouth structure that they can extend and bite you with. And so on land, you might think of worms as like, you know, what's a worm going to do to you? Well, in the ocean, in the marine environment, there's a very large group of worms and other animals that would probably surprise you by how bad they could hurt you. And so the Nermitia are one of them in which, if you're handling them, they can, they can actually bite you and take a, a chunk of skin out of you uh, by biting you. Okay, so let's talk about the circulatory system here. I have one slide I need to move in a different order. Open versus closed circulatory system. Most animals, most of the smaller animals we talked about so far have an open circulatory system. And what that means is they have a heart of some sort or a pump and it pushes the fluid around into a space. And the fluid, which is not really blood because it's not separated by these blood vessels, it kind of sloshes around the cells of the body and that's called an open circulatory system and that design works very well in small animals but as animals get bigger uh, especially like you take humans and, and whales and, and other very large much larger animals there needs to be a better ability to control blood flow or fluid flow in the animal so a closed circulatory system is where you, the blood stays basically inside blood vessels uh, and in order for the the nutrients to reach say the cells of the body has to come out of these closed vessels whereas in an open circulatory system it kind of just sloshes around it doesn't stay inside the tube all right our next group is the phylum mollusca uh, this is a really big marine group most of these animals are marine Many of them are protected by a hard shell made out of calcium carbonate. We've seen that material before in some of our uh, protozoans when we talked about them. They have a structure called a radula, which I'll talk about. Most of them have an open circulatory system. Now, when we talk about a mollusca, uh, we need to know the basic parts of a mollusca. And so uh, when, when they talk about this group, they often use this thing they call the ham and it stands for a hypothetical ancestral mollusk and the idea is that they have these four basic parts they have a muscular foot which is used for moving around they have a generally a thin layer of tissue that cover the organs of the animal called the mantle and the mantle is what will secrete the shell if an animal like a mollusk has a shell many of them do Inside the mantle is what's called the visceral mass. That's where all the organs are. And then somewhere in there near the mouth region, usually, is a structure called a radula. And a radula is a specialized feeding structure found only in the mollusks that is used for uh, feeding. And it's modified in different ways, but it's like a file. All right, so we have several mollusca, and they are the class 
monoplacophora, polyplacophora, gastropoda, scaphopoda, bivalvia, and cephalopoda. So we're going to go through all those right now. The first is an interesting one called the monoplacophora. They're single-shelled. They have a segmented body, which is they have repeating body segments. That's unusual in mollusca. You don't see that very often. They are a deep marine organism that uh, they have a reduced head and they use their foot for locomotion and they have a radula and really up until fairly recently we thought they were all extinct and I think it was just in the 1950s or 1960s they found living monoplacophorans um, so this is probably the closest looking organism to that ham that I told you about the second group is the polyplacophorans and these are all marine and you can tell them apart easily because they have these eight overlapping plates. They have a foot used for locomotion and they have a reduced head. We often call these the common names of these animals are chitons and a good friend of mine, um, a good friend of mine, Doug Ernesty, is a world leading expert on polyplacophorans. Okay, they also have a radula and again they use that radula mainly for scraping algae off of rocks as they move. The next group is the gastropoda. These are snails and slugs. You're probably familiar with these. And one of the interesting things about snails is right away is when you look at a snail, you obviously know the shell, that there's, there's a shell on most of the snails except for slugs. And what happens to the body during development of gastropods is the body turns. It's twisted on itself such that the anus of it ends up sitting kind of right above a snail's head as you can see there which is kind of an unusual uh, thing I would think in most animals and people have tried to come up with reasons why evolution might favor that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes they have a shell, sometimes they don't. It's often it's coiled in a circle um, but you, you've probably seen snails like that before. Some predatory snails one good example of those are the cone snails, which have this harpoon-like modification of that radula, and they can inject toxin into you. This is a cone snail here. They use it for paralyzing fish. They're found in tropical waters, and, and one example of them uh, are found in Australia. And they are very poisonous. People have died being, um, you know, stung, if you will, or, or bit uh, with this harpoon-like structure in cone snails. They have a very strong toxin in them, and uh, not only is the toxin very lethal, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a paralytic, it can paralyze you, they're finding that modifications to that toxin might be a good use for pain medication. Uh, so they've recently found a cone snail. Um, so there's a cone snail, for example, that has a toxin with a pain killing element that's like 200 times stronger than morphine. Okay, next group is a marine group, a benthic marine group. Benthic means it's on the bottom and they are filter feeders. So they're filtering out little segments or little pieces of particles that are in the water and they're buried in the ground uh, and they use the foot uh, to burrow into the ground and they do have a radula and they use that radula to move food to the gizzard. The gizzard is like a specialized stomach where they can grind up food. So the next one up is the class bivalvia and in the phylum mollusca the bivalvia is the only group that doesn't have a radula. So they have the other parts, they have a head, they have a foot, they have a mantle and they are filter feeders so they suck in water and capture food particles in the water and then filter it out and that is the phylum cephalopoda cephala remember we talked about cephalization so cephalopoda means head foot so these are animals that have their head basically almost like connected right to the top of the foot and they're all marine they have a head that is surrounded by tentacles they have a shell that's either external or internal or absent and I'll mention that in a second uh, they move by using the siphon that's made from a folding of the mantle the only group in the mollusca to have a closed circulatory system so these include um, 
octopods, which is plural for octopus, um, the cuttlefish. If you have a parakeet or bird, a lot of people use the uh, the, the cuttle bone is often used uh, for birds to sharpen their beak and that kind of thing. And then there's one that actually has a shell on it, and that's called the chambered nautilus. But the two cephalopods you're most familiar with will probably most likely easily be the octopus and the squid. Okay, so we're going to stop there. That'll get us through cephalopods, and then we'll move on from there to annelids and echinoderms.